And we are the presidents of the Amherst College Political Union. Before I give you some background on our organization, I'd like to thank the members of our team that have made this all possible. Firstly, thank you so much for our to our panelists tonight who have taken the time out of their incredibly hectic schedules to be here this evening. Additionally, I'd like to thank the members of our executive board who are also here with us tonight, our incredibly tactful treasurer, Mr. Terry Lee, and our director of public affairs, serving, also serving as tonight's moderator, Mr. Tommy Raskin. Now, to give you some background on our organization, the Amherst Political Union was founded in 1939 by Robert Morgenthau and Richard Wilber with the goal of increasing political discourse on Amherst campus. The APU prides itself on its nonpartisan structure and serves as a safe environment for individuals with a wide array of political views. Since its founding, the political union has sought to fight the political apathy that plagues other colleges by engaging members of the Amherst College campus in productive conversations related to salient and pressing political issues. We have an amazing event planned for you tonight, and we hope that it will catalyze a productive conversation on campus, not only about the Israel-Palestine conflict, but about political issues and current events in general. I am confident that you will all leave here tonight feeling more informed than when you walked in. If you wish to continue the discussion for down here tonight, we strongly encourage you to attend our weekly meetings held every Monday at 8 p.m. in the McCaffrey Room in the Keith Campus Center. Note that our meetings have a cafe-style, casual, discussion-based format, and so you can stop in whenever you have the time. Before we begin, I have a few requests to make of the audience. Please turn off your cell phones as the event is being recorded. Also note that uh, food and drinks are not permitted in the theater, and that standing in the aisles is prohibited because of the fire code, so please take a seat. That being said, I would like to hand it over to tonight's moderator, Tommy Raskin. Thank you for the applause. I haven't even done anything yet. <laughs> I do appreciate it. I am Tommy Raskin. I'm the Director of Public Affairs for the Amherst Political Union. And I'll be moderating our forum this evening with the highly indispensable William Herman by my side. We're fortunate to have with us tonight five esteemed panelists who will share their insights into the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Starting on my right, you're joined by Professor Mary Wilson, a Middle East historian and scholar at UMass Amherst. Professor Wilson serves on the Board of Directors of the Middle East Studies Association and the Board of Trustees for the American Center for Oriental Research in Amman, Jordan. Next to Professor Wilson, we have Rabbi Bruce Bromberg Seltzer. Rabbi Bruce, as he likes to be called, has worked as the Jewish Religious Advisor at Amherst since July of 2002 and has taught, has taught uh, courses on Israel at Western New England University. We're, we're looking forward to his insights this evening. We're also joined by Muhammad Abdullah, next to Rabbi Bruce. Mr. Abdullah is the religious advisor for Muslim students here at Amherst, and is the co-founder and former president of Hampshire Mosque. Beside him is Professor Adi Gordon. He is currently teaching a class on the history of Israel and working on a book about the prominent Zionist Hans Kohn. Next to Professor, <coughs> next to Professor Gordon, we have Gordon Levin. Professor Levin is the Dwight Morrow Professor of History and American Studies here at Amherst. He has taught classes in American diplomatic history and the history of Israel. Ladies and gentlemen, let us please give all of our panelists a warm and enthusiastic, welcoming round of applause. <laughs> Friends, tonight we're grappling with one of the most intractable and controversial crises facing the world today. Out of this recognition, I, as your moderator, will take on a painstakingly objective role as a facilitator. With that being said, we must expect and accept a certain level of respectful contention throughout the course of this forum in order for us to learn more about the complexities of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The questions we have formulated are not intended to bias the audience or the panel in any particular direction, but rather to spark a substantive and relevant conversation on this topic. This evening's discussion will be structured around 10 to 15 broad questions designed to provoke this discussion. The panelists will each have 90 seconds to respond to the questions, followed by, once they've all answered, a three to five minute free period in which they can respond to one another. At the end of the questions, we'll open it up to the audience. We please invite you to come down and bring your questions. So, without further ado, we'll start with the first question. Professor Levin, you can start. We'll go in the little alternate orders. How do you begin to explain the Israeli-Palestinian conflict to someone who's never heard of it before? That's the question. I guess I would say uh, that over the course of the last hundred years, there has 
has developed a conflict between two national movements contesting for the same land. Uh, the Zionist movement uh, emerged out of the complexities of Jewish political life in Eastern Europe in the late 19th century and began a process of settlement in Palestine to recreate Jewish national life and got an enormous boost from the British Empire in the form of the Balfour Declaration. And from the first moment that this movement began, there was a sense on the part of the Arab community of Palestine that it was a threat. And so over the years, there emerged a countervailing Palestinian national movement, which has taken many forms. And the contestation between these two national movements has continued and been unresolved for the last hundred years. I'm trying to think if I have much uh, to add to that. I'll keep this uh, answer relatively short. Uh, I'll just say that I think the, the only approach to, uh, to engaging or introducing the, the conflict is really by fo focusing on the two uh, at least two different historical dimensions are of that of the history uh, of Zionism and its context, and that of Arab nationalism, history of the um, modern uh, To me, if I would like to introduce this uh, complicated topic to somebody who hears about it for the first time, I would say that uh, this conflict represents the embodiment of hum the, the human failure to establish a ground for coexistence um, completely, uh, where there is um, uh, no respect to those who are different from us, to those who have different beliefs and different values, different uh, ethnic background, and uh, a zero effort to establish bridges to uh, try to consider how to live together. Uh, just the, the historical facts and the details, you know, uh, can, can be, uh, you can find them. And uh, know about them, but we need to get into the core issue as human beings to approach this subject. Um, I don't have a lot to add to what has been said, um, except for just a few points. Um, one, I think that the Jewish longing for Zion is an integral part of, uh, of Judaism and has been since the Babylonian exile, so long before the Bible itself was even completed. Um, Jerusalem is mentioned 669 times in the Jewish Bible. Um, and lots and lots of Jewish practices, customs, including the time for daily prayers, um, architectural things in the synagogue and in the home, and uh, wedding life cycle, practices as well as burial practices are all tied to a, a longing to return to the ancestral Jewish homeland. So that is adding to all the political things that Professor Levin and the others were talking about. Um, and I am, um, as always, very heartened to hear about the, and to think about the coexistence that my colleague Mohammed was just talking about. There is a lot of coexistence work, and people trying to do that, but it is always pushed aside by the media, which is much more interested in contention than dialogue. Thank you. Um, I agree with all of my colleagues and would like to add that, especially to an American audience, I would try to impress upon them that the conflict is not a religious conflict. It is a conflict over territory, um, plain and simple, um, to introduce a, a note of controversy, I would say that it has always puzzled me that Palestinians have been made to pay for European anti-Semitism, which resulted finally in the Holocaust. And to the rabbi, I would say certainly, the Hebrew Bible does mention Jerusalem many, many times. 
Jewish prayers over the centuries have always talked about a return to Jerusalem. And yet, it was not until the late 19th century that Jews began moving as groups to what they considered the promised land. And so that timing, in particular, needs to be explained. Yes, yes, please follow up. There's also another microphone. Please feel free to pass both around. <laughs> and it works. It does. I just want to follow up on Mohammed's point because it, uh, it's, a, it's a good challenge. And it's a, I think it, it raises a question of a different soul. So what I think happens when we introduce or we just, when we engage uh, the question of the conflict is on the one hand, an understandable and in a way justifiable uh, experience of alienation. You don't, it's, it's very hard to identify with the belligerent sides. You look at them and you think, what is going on? And it's very easy to look at that and, and find it, that it doesn't make any sense. And it's a failure. It's a story of a failure. And precisely because of that, I think the real challenge is to try and see what did it originally mean? How did we even begin to get into, uh, into that kind of inhumanity and, and complete apathy um, for the other before it began? Because it didn't begin in either side from that. It began with other wishes, desires, aspirations. And this process, I think, is humanly vital to understand. How, how, how do we get from A to B? That was my two cents. Professor Levin, would you like to respond? Uh, well, the only thing I, I, I would say is that there was a potential for violence built into the very fabric of the relationship between the two peoples, given the fact that Zionism had the vision and the intention of creating a national reality in a land which was overwhelmingly, uh, at, at, at the initial stages of Zionism, Palestinian Arab. And uh, this meant that if there was not to be consent for that project on the Arab side, uh, some form of force or violence was necessary in carrying it forward. And in, in the basic initial factor, I think, was the British Empire, without whose creation of the mandate and, and making possible the, the creation of the initial Jewish national reality of two or 300,000 by the late 1930s. There couldn't, have, there couldn't have been an Israel, but of course the British mandate was resisted constantly by the uh, Arab population in Palestine. So it, it must be understood, you know, we, 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 we follow the daily uh, events, uh, the conflict over the years, but it, 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 there's a foundation in the very nature of the, of the situation, which makes it uh, hard for, for conflict and violence to have been avoided. We can move on, if that's okay. All right, several of you have already touched upon the idea that it was not until 1948 that the state of Israel was actualized and the Jewish aspiration for a national homeland was, at, was uh, actualized. My question for you is, was the 1948 Israeli War of Independence primarily a heroic or a shameful endeavor? <laughs> no one wants to respond first. You didn't ask us to prepare for that question. <laughs> I think it was both uh, heroic in the sense that the Jewish existence in Palestine was challenged uh, as Jews attempted to bring to life the UN uh, 1947 partition plan. Uh, and that 
was an engagement of enormous sacrifice and, and courage, but shameful in the sense that in the conduct of the war, 700,000 Palestinians either fled or were expelled from what became Israel and were not allowed back. Uh, and that reality has also shaped and formed the conflict in, over the next 67 years. So one could argue, I think, that Israel had a legitimate right of resistance to uh, protect what it had, what had been created in Palestine, but that in resisting, uh, uh, shameful acts were, were perpetrated. Um, I, I agree that it's certainly both. Uh, from a military standpoint, it clearly was heroic of Israel, which was already facing attacks by Arabs while the British were still there. Um, by 48, the British had um, were much more, uh, they weren't, I wouldn't say, totally pro towards the Arabs, but had, um, you know, they were leaving bases to them and they were, um, you know, bringing in the British trained armies of the neighbors. And once Israel was declared, seven countries attacked it. Um, they had no army, they couldn't legally buy weapons anywhere in the world until 48, until the country was established, while all the countries around them were arming. Obviously, the um, the fighting didn't work out, uh, but I think Israel thought it was really at risk of being destroyed and um, and fought back heroically. But it's true that the um, that the way Israel treated the Palestinians and the way both sides really conducted the war with kind of a burn burn everything mentality, um, trying to push people out and um, really being as aggressive as possible is horrible and it also was um, very difficult that um, difficult for Israel to acknowledge this and it's only really in the last 10, 15 years that the true kind of complexities of what the leaders did and didn't do um, have started to come to light. Well, to answer the question, I can't really, I think for many Jews it was certainly a heroic battle. Um, I think for some Jews, it was shameful in that so many Arabs were um, forced to leave um, what became the state of Israel and were not allowed to return. Um, when Israel was accepted as a member of the United Nations, um, thereby becoming an internationally recognized state, one of the conditions was that Israel would allow the Palestinian refugees to return. That condition was never fulfilled, um, which I certainly regard as shameful. Um, I would say that the British leaving Palestine, their primary concern was to get out with as few British soldiers killed as possible. I do not think, and historians by and large have proven that the British did not favor um, Arabs over the um, nascent state of Israel at the time of their withdrawal. Um, the Arab armies um, were not large. They had been trained by the British, in particular Jordan's army. Jordan had um, its leading officers were British officers. They were all forced to withdrawn, um, not to lead Jordanian troops in the war. So I find that Britain may have made a terrible mess of the whole job, but they were not predisposed by 1948 to one side or the other. They just recognized that they had created a mess and wanted to get out of there. <coughs> Um, one thing 
to add to um, to uh, Rabbi Bruce's point of uh, that it's only been remembered in the last um, ten years. I think this history of remembering and forgetting um, uh, the Nakba is uh, is an interesting, complicated process, both on the Israeli and the Palestinian Arab side. Um, is you all know that um, the uh, Nakba was commemorated, for example, in the writings of some of his heart, which was written, the author himself, a member of the war generation, who was mainstream Mapai member and, and, and Knesset member uh, as it gets, as middle Israel as, uh, as it can be, it was published. It was read, it was taught uh, by high school. So the facts were somehow both there and not there at the same time. There is a process, and Meryl Dinesti has written beautifully uh, about this, about erasing the marks of the past from um, uh, Israeli uh, landscape. So remembering and forgetting uh, have always somehow intermingled uh, regarding this. I could also mention that in the past, I said, 20 years has been actually remarkable work done on the Israeli side of mapping um, Arab Palestine, and, uh, it's uh, available on the web, what is the name um, of uh, the organization. And of course, the, it's not only, if it's a conflict, there are at least two sides. So of course, there are also questions about Palestinian uh, remembering of, uh, of uh, patterns of memory and, and forgetting of the NACPA. So I'm just touching on a few uh, more questions on this. Professor Gordon, you used the yes. word NACPA catastrophe. Could you clarify for our audience what exactly that means and why you use that term instead of other terms to refer to the historical event? The NACPA is a, you, you, the, the term NACPA comes in, in the, uh, the, Professor Wilson, correct me if I'm mistaken, but the first time that the term was used is right after the war uh, in an account of the collapse of, the, of on the war on the calamity, but I think then the term was used for the first time and I don't know when it became ubiquitous in use uh, among Western scholars. Um, but pretty pretty early on. <laughs> um, but 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 it relates to uh, the same phenomenon that uh, Professor Lennon was uh, referring to the um, transfer, expulsion, flee, at any rate exodus of Seven, I mean, and here again, the numbers are contested, roughly 700,000. Um, basically, it's a part of sort of a double demographic revolution in Palestine, Israel during the time. As many of you, those who take my course know um, that the Zionists, the Jews, constituted a minority uh, in the Palestinian, in, sorry, the um, uh, population in the land between the Jordan River and, and the sea, at the very top it was less, oh, about a third of the population. It was around um, 48, 49, with the Nakba on the one hand, and the uh, coming of, um, of many um, Jewish refugees and immigrants from the Arab lands and other, uh, elsewhere that it, the Jews became a majority for the first time in the territory and the, the Arabs became I actually wanted to just mention something. You know, you're mentioning the number of uh, Jews who had to flee, almost all of them, from Arab land, which was roughly close to 700, 750,000. We're talking about almost the same amount. And um, if you know 1948, as, as I'm sure most of the colleagues know, you know, some other countries around then were created you know, out of the former British Empire. The partitions, you know, where we were dealing with tens of millions of people of populations transferred. And it, it is, um, you know, while for any individual, individual family group, tragic, it is something that um, happened numerous times in the 20th century with the creation of countries. And um, on the vast majority of them, you never hear about, you know, the, the people coming back. Um, I'm sure they want to come back in, you know, people that had to flee from Pakistan or India. Um, and we don't even know yet how many people died there. There's no adequate counting of 
the numbers of people who died. I'm sure many of them want to go back, but that's not ever part of a historical discussion. Well, without any prompting, several of you have already pointed to the question of the Palestinians being displaced or voluntarily fleeing, people with different stories regarding that. My question now is, do you support the right of return for Palestinian refugees who left Palestine either in 1948 or in 1967 during the Six-Day War? Um, in uh, Ari Shavit's new book, My Promised Land, one of the best insights is his understanding that the Israeli left uh, dovish notion that the conflict could be resolved purely on a territorial basis uh, is, leaves out this question of, in, in Shadid, which is very powerful. Create the Palestinian state alongside the Israeli state. The, the, the refugee problem is not about returning to the same house which one left whether it stands or not, but rather the possibility of repatriation, more similar to the Israeli Polish um, uh, law of, of return. Um, so it will be hard to persuade the Israeli voters um, to support the creation of a two-state solution, which, which also, in addition to it, um, uh, includes a right of return to Israel. I may be pessimistic, I may be wrong, but my notion that in, in the real world of, uh, of uh, Israeli politics, especially now that the Israeli left has been decimated to half of its force in the, in the, in the 90s, realistically, um, it's not going to help. Um, well, I'm not a Palestinian myself, but um, just uh, so I literally, nobody has the right, or I have the right to tell you that. Uh, they have the right to return to their original uh, uh, homeland. So if, it was, if they were able to form um, an effort to, uh, to seek the right to return to their homes, definitely that has to be uh, uh, granted to them. It's so complicated. It's, um, the land is taken. Um, the, um, uh, the state of Israel is a reality. The, uh, um, you know, some of it uh, this time goes back 60, 70 years ago. Uh, so we are talking about a very complicated situation. And um, but definitely, uh, we cannot exempt people from the right to um, um, to, to to be connected and to return to the past. Um, the the issue is um, we as you know, I, I speak for Muslims and for Arabs and, uh, you know, the, the formation of the state of Israel, the, um, the, the, uh, all the many uh, wars that took place, especially the very recent one last month, it, it, it is causing a state of agony and a state of uh, uh, continuous pain and sadness and, uh, you know, many people in the region are traumatized with that. So when you address an issue such as do Palestinians have the right to return, you know, they will look at you and with just uh, with full respect, but they feel there, there are much more painful things than just addressing, um, you know, particular, uh, you know, uh, detail like this with, with full respect to it. So I, I really think, again, I would like to, uh, I'd like for us to, again, look at the perspective in a balanced way. Um, you know, I did get a chance to address the first, that previous question then. The formation of the State of Israel was uh, done with complete disregard to the people who lived there. Um, the, um, Britain was an occupying force. Um, the, you know, colonialism was the, um, uh, the reality of the world at that time. Uh, most Arab and Muslim countries were colonized. Um, until today, they teach in schools that you know their resources were taken. Um, they have no um, you know say of how to uh, uh, get.
get the duration or, or how to govern their countries. And uh, definitely, the, yes, colonial, the era of colonialism is over, but the state of Israel is there, and uh, it's at the heart of the Arab world. You have a country that has a, you know, the main religion of the country is different. The main language of the country is different. Um, so that, you know, if you are talking about coexistence, if you are talking about uh, respecting the Palestinian people, the Arab people, the Muslim people, the Christian people, you know, everybody who is not uh, a Jew, uh, you have to show respect to the other point of view. And, you know, how Muslims and Arabs are, um, are receiving this. So, I, you know, again, I know that your question was very particular, but I would hope to focus on the issues that cause so much pain to the people in that area. Thank you. So, um, Israelis view the right of return, as, as uh, Professor Gordon was explaining, as almost like state aside. Um, the whole idea of two states for two people is that each would be the state for its people, and any number of others could live in the other countries. Um, there's not a lot of data on uh, minority religions and ethnic groups doing so well, um, particularly given the language that comes from many of the Palestinian leadership, certainly from Hamas, whose charter still calls for the extraction of um, destruction of all Jews by jihad and expulsion and talks about the worst kind of uh, anti-Semitic um, conspiracy theories. They mention the Freemasons three times in their designs. Um, and the, I think it, you have to take a step back in that most Israelis view this as an Israeli-Arab conflict and the Palestinian is one element of it. And considering the, the language and rhetoric that comes from the whole Arab world and from Iran, as well as other Muslim countries that are not Arab, um, Israel is extremely threatened. It may not be threatened by the, directly, militarily by its neighbors, but it is under intense um, existential threats. Um, it's the only country where People can get up in the United Nations and call for its destruction. Um, you know, heads of states that are working to create a nuclear program, and that's considered okay. Um, and so, when it hears that that the Palestinians won't recognize Israel as a Jewish state and want a right of return to Israel um, in numbers that would make Jews a minority in its own state, it it kind of calls into question the whole two-state solution, which I am very strongly in favor of. And But the two-state solution, with whatever types of um, compensation and types of things that Professor Levin was talking about, um, which may not be enough, but maybe um, considering what, uh, what would go over in Israel, maybe all the, the best that's going to come. Um, two states for two people. The Palestinian state will have to be the one that the majority of Palestinians return to if they do it all. Thank you. Um, not to mince my words, yes, I do support the right of return. And I think we need to bear in mind that Israel has uh, relies on expatriate workers, not Palestinians, and that um, Palestinians could return to um, what is today called Israel and find an economic niche. Uh, that said, um, the Palestinians who most need um, a passport and a place to live are those Palestinians who are still in refugee camps in Lebanon, in Syria, in Jordan, and in the occupied territories. Um, I think that except for Palestinians in the refugee camps, um, Many, most Palestinians have settled elsewhere and have happy lives elsewhere and would certainly choose to visit their ancestral lands, their families there, but would probably not choose to return. And I don't think it's a stretch of the imagination to 
allowed Palestinians the right to return. After all, Israel has a law that Jews have the right to return after 2,000 years. I think the panelists would like to respond to what one another said. Topic. I, I think we can see how fraught this is. Uh, my only sense is that if one is talking about a two-state solution that resolves the conflict forever, if one could imagine such a miracle, my own sense is that it has to include some component which addresses the issue of Nakbar and the and Palestinian return. Uh, I, I think that there have been many negotiations and numbers put forward. The vast majority uh, in these I, I'm thinking of the Geneva negotiations in 2002 between uh, Israel, Israeli peace groups and, and Palestinian uh, uh, peace groups uh, who were negotiating this. Uh, I think some number, uh, greater than symbolic, but far less than would, talk, than would threaten the very demographic structure of Israel to give recognition, to give respect, uh, might be able to be arrived at. Uh, Adi is probably right that the political climate in Israel now makes it almost impossible uh, to imagine, but I'm just trying to think through what it would take, uh, what it would take to, to uh, have a peace agreement, and I, I, I think that it has to include some recognition of of this question. I want to add that the acknowledgement of the story of the other would go um, you know, out in the open and by the majority and by the, the, the main spokespeople, not just by uh, well-meaning activists, but you know, the Palestinian leadership explaining that there's an ancient Jewish connection to, to the land of Israel. Um, you know, they deny on their website the existence of the Jewish temples, which are clear historical facts um, described, you know, both in biblical and extra-biblical things, and nobody disputes them except for basically in Palestinian textbooks and in other parts of the Arab world. So if um, that, uh, you know, ancient ties are acknowledged, and then on the other hand, I think the Israeli Prime Minister and other cabinet members have to get up and, and acknowledge their responsibility in the Nakba. And um, it may, it, I'm not sure that would go far enough, but that is the, you know, kind of saying where the common narratives are wrong and are failing and are not going to address the needs of the other um, would be a very big start. And when most Israelis hear that the Palestinians want to return to Israel, um, which already has a 25% non-Jewish minority um, of citizens. You know, they feel that not only are their, their story not being heard, but their, their, um, the needs of a homeland for Jews is not really uh, the ultimate goal. They see the ultimate goal of, of you know, a Palestine from the river to the sea, which was the chant at the local um, protests this summer. You know, which means no Israel. There are many religious Jews and religious Christians, for that matter, who argue that what some call the West Bank belongs to Israel because God ordained it in the Bible, saying that Judea and Samaria would go to the Jews. We know that since the Six Day War, the, um, Israel has had, a, has had a presence in the West Bank or in Judea and Samaria, if you choose to call it that. Do you find Israel's presence? in the West Bank at all objectionable or illegal? Why or why not? Uh, Professor Wilson. Here is me. <laughs> um, yes, I, by international law, by the Fourth Geneva Con Convention, it certainly is illegal. Occupied territory um, should, in occupied territory, the Demographics should not be changed. People should not be settled there. Um, newcomers from the occupier 
um, the people who live in occupied territories should not be ejected, um, much less killed. Um, so that's just for starters. Certainly uh, objectionable in the way that it uh, happens now and has happened over time. Um, but parts of the area that are called the West Bank or Judea Samaria had um, Jewish, uh, large, if not majorities, large percentage of Jews living in them. Jerusalem had a Jewish majority pretty much during any time in the previous century. Um, and there, um, once 48 Jews weren't allowed to be in the eastern part of uh, you know, the Jewish part of the old city, the entire Jewish quarter was exploded, destroyed, razed to the ground. Um, and so, you know, if we're talking about including Jerusalem, um, then it's probably a non-starter for most people in Israel, um, where the record of Jewish access to holy sites is non-existent um, between 48 to 67. Um, and the record of Christians and Arabs access to their holy sites is 100% been guaranteed, um, maybe not on an everyday basis, but in general, um, with, with individual religious control from the time of 67 on. Um, and the same with Gush Etzion, an area of Jewish farms and settlements that's uh, south of Jerusalem, uh, where the in the early parts of the war, the population was expelled, um, you know, in areas like that and, and parts of Jerusalem, I think are going to remain part of Israel and with um, land uh, swaps, you know, is the typical type of thing that's described. That total land is, I believe, like 3% of the land under discussion. Yeah, just, uh, that also brings up the issue of um, illegal settlements. And um, that are uh, all over the the the, uh, the land, and uh, so this is something that is illegal. Uh, nobody is able to object that. Palestinians um, can voice their uh, concerns and their complaints, but um, uh, the international community is uh, doing nothing. Uh, no, uh, no uh, solution is. is and Israel continues to, to build illegal settlements and uh, they see this as justifiable and okay and as a right. Um, you know, when, when, uh, when you are on the weak side, uh, and this is also comes to the issue that I was trying to raise earlier, that most people in the region are, um, uh, are, uh, are so distressed with everything that is happening, of course they have a lot of their own problems, of course, it is a different issue. But when they see all of this, that's, that really uh, makes them feel humiliated, make them feel, um, and more than any other nation or other people, the Palestinians, they feel uh, um, uh, the brunt of injustice every single day. And the people of Gaza, you know, at the heart of it, uh, the, the, the living conditions are unacceptable. So, and the West Bank is absolutely, uh, you know, uh, the same thing. So, again, are we capable of providing any insight on how to provide solutions to, as we are concerned about uh, Israelis and uh, Israeli citizens, their protection, their rights, their um, safety? Are we, are we uh, capable of providing an equal attention to the other side or not. So this is something that we are just purely talking about either us or you. It's not, it should not be, it is not that, it should never be that. Because this is the cause of the problem. It should be how, you know, my right can be protected and your right can also be protected. If we are unable to establish this, if we are unable to think with this mentality, then this, all of this is, I'm uh, sorry to say, it's a waste of time. So, the, the spectrum of Israeli opinions on this is, you know, the, on, there's a significant number of 
Israel is at times it used to be, you know, close to uh, I would say half of the population, or sometimes even more, who saw that the occupation A is morally objectionable, morally wrong, but also a few other things as corrupting as something that sort of uh, that drags the state of Israel down, that weakens uh, the state of Israel in many regards, that divests, that, that, uh, that pulls uh, um, money that could have been invested in certain, uh, uh, certain areas of uh, the Israeli life uh, to, to um, um, those uh, wrong directions, as uh, something that um, endangers Israel's legitimacy and international um, uh, standing and something that may run out of control and in a way hijack the entire Zionist project by creating an ideology which is not quite Zionism but something else, sort of the ideology, a uh, settled, settled uh, ideology. So that's part of the Israeli, uh, the one end of the Israeli spectrum. And then, uh, you have conservative and right uh, wing Israelis who do not, uh, who think, I mean, one of the main, major distinctions, I would say, with the Israeli uh, discussion uh, on the uh, occupied territories is is time working on Israel's side or doesn't it? Right? So I would, I would claim that the left wing has always felt that this is a hot potato and actually the, 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 at times working against. Uh, Israel in this regard. As time goes by, uh, Israel will find itself as occupier in a worse and worse situation. The right wing does not feel like that. And of course, does not have the same, does not have more qualms about, or, um, about um, the occupation. And the thing that actually, in, in the real world, as far as the, the way that the Israeli right wing sees it, it's an asset um, of sorts. And it makes Israel stronger rather than. than uh, Weaker, and this is sort of the divide, as I mentioned earlier on. If you look at the, the voters, it's, it's becoming clear that more and more Israelis uh, drift to to the right and, and have lesser uh, of an issue um, with that. So that's. I agree with uh, everything that everybody said. You know, as, as being part of the picture, I I think that. Uh, like the question of the right of return, the question of now, what is a vast settlement project? We're talking about 350,000 Israeli Jews living over the Green Line, former border in settlements. We're talking about another 350,000 Israeli Jews living in new neighborhoods of uh, East Jerusalem, which are also settlements in the sense that they're built over the line. So we're talking about uh, over 10% of the Jewish population of Israel living over the Green Line. And uh, politically, it's a powerful group. Uh, the present Israeli government is deeply committed to the settlements. Uh, and on the Arab side, clearly, there's a sense that if there's to be two states, the border has got to be somewhere close to the border of 1967, which already leaves 78% uh, of the former mandate of Palestine, west of the Jordan River, to Israeli Jews. So just as the right of return uh, stands as an almost uh, now insoluble question, the question of the settlements, it, I, it's hard to see uh, how one resolves this. Again, you know, in 2002, the Geneva Agreement that was worked out by Israeli-Palestinian peace groups drew the line very close to the 67 borders. Uh, and, but that now would require the movement of upwards of 150 to 200,000 uh, Israeli Jews back into uh, Israel proper, which uh, at the present time, no Israeli government would feel able, willing, uh, confident enough to even imagine. So uh, this settlement question stands as an enormous barrier to a two-state solution. Uh, I'm assuming that later we will 
get to a discussion of the one state solution. Uh, but if there's anything that is keeping alive the notion of a one state solution, it's this massive settlement uh, project. And just uh, briefly, so I think the context of the two state solution should be mentioned again. It feels like a specter from the 90s that we uh, bring to the fore, but this is the context. I think no one would argue, I mean, I think it, there's a consensus that um, settlements is that are detrimental, are, uh, are a block, uh, that they are attempted to block any prospect of, um, of a two state solution. I think settlers themselves would say it, and uh, obviously also um, uh, people uh, on, on the left. Something interesting is at play, however, and I think we should highlight this. A, the major growth of settlement uh, has occurred in the years that we call the peace process. So as of the 90s. Also, the face of the occupation and the face of the conflict has grown, has grown much uglier, much more inhumane in those um, very years. So it's, uh, the, the conflict that we leave aside um, but um, the, the settlement, it's obvious that it was seen as some kind, some kind of a tough negotiation, like, you know, time is running out, um, um, cease what you can, and also, you know, you, went, you take, as it were, one step forward with this and that proposal, and two steps back with building uh, more of a settlement. So in this, you know, Twilight Zone, the reality, of the land has changed dramatically. I, th I think that um, it's hard to imagine, none of us here seem to be very much in favor of the settlements, but it's hard to even imagine their, their, um, their uh, mindset. When I lived in Israel during the year 93-94, when the Oslo Accords were being discussed, um, right kind of halfway between the Israeli Prime Minister and the President's house where every demonstration happened for each group um, pretty much non-stop. I lived with the son of one of the founders of Kusha not, not a, a one of the, not an activist founder, but a, just a general person who's been, you know, he grew up in settlements. His fathers lived and his mother lived most of their life in settlements. And not like just the settlements of people who went there for better economic purposes. You know, they, they were in the hardcore, he, they were living in Ofra, and um, you know, his father would have to check out a M16 to drive to Jerusalem to get him to drive back. And, and they thought that was, you know, they never thought that was a puzzling or strange phenomenon um, where I just, you know, had, didn't even want to go. And, couldn't understand why they wanted to be on the other side of the largest, uh, kind of the other side of, from Jerusalem of the largest population, Arab population center in that part. But, um, you know, he wouldn't understand this entire discussion. You know, he just wouldn't get it because for him, you know, he does have, in his mind, you know, the Bible is a, a deed and, you know, it's a land deed. And so, you know, it, the problem is that um, it's easy for us to discount that. But then when you start to, so I'm just saying we have to acknowledge that that's there with all its complexities and um, you know, it was all parts of the Israeli political spectrum, at least all the mainstream parties promoted the settlement activity at various times uh, for economic reasons, for political reasons, some of them for religious reasons. and. Um, you know, they realized all of a sudden that it kind of, I think it turned into its own monster that's hard to, hard to put back or something, you know, it's out of the, the genie's out of the bottle. But, um, but it has to, the settlements are going to have to go, many of them, but every time, for, from the Israeli point of view, every time they have withdrawn from land, they've been attacked from it. Um, less so with, um, Egypt, where you know Sadat came and said no more peace, no more war, and came and really spoke beautifully about peace. But um, you know they pulled out of Lebanon and they've been attacked by Hezbollah multiple times. They pulled out of Gaza, however imperfectly they did that, and have been um, attacked you know almost nonstop. So 
in their mind, to make these hard concessions to just be attacked from an area that puts the, the borders of Israel as, uh, not the borders, the entire length of the country as small as seven miles. So be closer than Northampton where I live to the Mediterranean Sea is the West Bank and the Netanya area. So, you know, long, shorter than it will take me to drive home tonight, one town or two towns over, you know, they, they feel like that's a, an unbearable threat. Whether that's legitimate or not, that's what they feel. I, I think that's a really good point. Uh, what I sense is a kind of tragic dialectic in which the extremes on both sides reinforce each other. I mean, Hamas has done enormous damage to the Israeli peace movement over the years uh, and has been a great help in a sense to the Israeli settler movement. Uh, there, there's a way in which uh, the mutual reinforcement of the most extreme elements on both sides continues right up to most recent events uh, in which in response to Hamas firing rockets into Israel, we have the Israeli government uh, annexing another 100,000 acres, uh, or, or, or whatever number of acres it was, uh, in the vicinity of Efrat, a quid pro quo. So again, the, the extremes on both sides have managed to, uh, to reinforce each other. My friends, if I could just interject for one second. I'm going to utter a word that we're getting more and more accustomed to hearing. It's a word in Afrikaans, apartheid. Apartheid literally means apartheid or separation. And these days, a lot of people have been leveling the accusation against Israel that its treatment of the Palestinians qualifies Israel as an apartheid state. Do you hear that view or not? I, I think it's, it's not true. I, let me put it this way. Israel proper, that is Israel within the, the 67 borders, uh, has an Arab population of 25% who are citizens of Israel, who vote, who go to university. Uh, I'm not saying their life is perfect. I'm not saying that there's no discrimination. Uh, but it's night and day from apartheid. So if we're talking about Israel proper, that is the state of Israel within the 67 borders, the concept of apartheid, uh, to describe it, is absurd. If one includes the occupied territories, then you come closer to it, though not exact. It could be said that in the occupied territories, you have a situation analogous to the Bantustans uh, in South Africa, in which, with all of the settlements and the new roads, the Palestinian population has been carved up into a series of mini city-states uh, whose status is state is is not stateless entirely because it's the Palestinian Authority, but it, they have. Uh, no real state. And in that sense, if one is talking about West Bank, some, some analogies could be made to, to apartheid. So I, I, I think one has to be very careful in, in using that term. Could I? Um, I want to go next because I agree with Professor Levin. And I think that Israel proper uh, Israel within the 1948 borders is not an apartheid state. I do think the occupied territories, the West Bank, um, is an apartheid state um, or has an apartheid system because of these uh, Bantu stands. Um, Israel proper um, is a state with institutionalized racism. I'm sorry to say, yes, Palestinian citizens of Israel do have the vote. However, they can't live where they might want to live. Uh, they cannot buy land. 
They do pay taxes, but their taxes do not come back to their communities uh, proportionate to the number of Palestinians. Therefore, the, uh, the educational system of Israel is, serves Jewish citizens far better than it serves its Palestinian citizens. Um, in 2011, an Arab uh, Supreme Court justice was one of the judges that tried the case against the, the immediate past president Moshe Katsav and found him guilty of misconduct. And, um, you know, certainly Arabs, citizens of Israel, and uh, have attained ranks as high as major general in the Israeli armed forces, and are as many as 14 seats at the height of the parliament. And, you know, while I would never say Israel is a perfect democracy, it certainly is not an apartheid state. You know, what happens on the other side of the Green Line in the, the um, West Bank or Judea Samaria, or however you want to call it, you know, is unbelievably discriminatory. And uh, I like the word that Professor Gordon used, corrupting. And um, it, you know, that's why I'm not in favor of it. Uh, but it doesn't, even there, I'm not sure it approaches uh, it certainly is not apartheid and um, doesn't approach it. And the whole point of having a two-state solution is that we can have Palestinians in charge of their own land. So um, bringing that up as a means to kind of stop the two-state solution and any negotiations to me seems self-defeating. Just last month, um, six weeks ago, we had a war in which uh, 2,000 Palestinians were dead, 80% of them are civilians, 300 children. Um, you know, you can imagine the, um, the catastrophe and what the, the people of Gaza have gone through, and that happens every few years. And we are trying to talk and describe if the state of Israel is a apartheid state or not. To me, a state that causes that much aggression has to be reminded that they are humans, that they need to show some respect and to dignify the human beings and the innocent civilians who are being killed, whether they are discriminated against the Palestinians who live in Israel or not. The real issue remains, what about those who were killed and they are innocent human beings. And I will keep repeating this point because this is the dilemma. This is the issue. You cannot convince people in the Arab world that Israel is, is interested in peace when you have an acts of aggression like this. So this is the issue and this is what should really need to be addressed. And uh, we need to, to figure out if you, if, we, if you are really interested in a solution, you know, try to do something major has to change in order to convince the people surrounding Israel that this state is interested in the safety and well-being of the Palestinians and treating them well. We need to, to face the truth if we are interested in a solution. In that case, we can, after solving the major problem, hopefully after that, addressing how to, the state of Israel can function, how non-Jews can live, how Palestinians can live, you know, they can get a driver's license and they can get a permit to build their buildings and all the details of how to conduct life, but they live under incomplete inhumane conditions and not only that, the entire section, the entire uh, Gaza was unterrorized for 50 days. There's no single family there except uh, uh, has uh, a relative who died. I actually, if you give me a chance to read, uh, I have a, ironically an Amherst alumni, uh, 1999, Yasin Dawood. He posted on his uh, Facebook page uh, uh, in, uh, on August 5th, 1984, Israeli warplanes bombed my neighborhood and killed my classmates, teachers, and relatives. 2014, 
Two days ago, Israeli warplanes bombed and killed eight of my wife's Laila and Haddad relatives. Lujan Al Farah, four years. Yara Al Farah, eight years. Abdurrahman Al Farah, eight years. Nadine Al Farah, nine years. Muhammad Al Farah, twelve years. Iman Al Farah, twenty-eight years. Awatif Al Farah, twenty-nine years. Usama Al Farah, thirty-four years. Abdul Malik Abdul. Salam Farah, 54 years. Eight individuals from the same family were killed by strikes. And the, the media was full of these stories. The four children were playing on the, on the beach and they were killed. So this is the issue that we need to address. And if we claim to be standing for human rights, if we claim to that we, we, we do respect the sanctity of life, if we really are interested in peace, are we interested in, in, in peace or we are interested in, I'm sorry to say, intellectual discussions? So, I'm sorry to get the game topic, but I will not ask for um, I, I have nothing to say uh, on this question, but what I do want to say, I've noticed that in the first hour and 15 minutes of our discussion, we talked only about Israel and Israel's agency, and actually we're talking about conflict with the least. Well, it's worth talking about since we've brought up Gaza now, the disparate conditions between Palestinians living in the West Bank and Palestinians living in Gaza. The situation in Gaza has been described by various Western intellectuals as an open-air prison in which the, the traffic of goods and people is severely limited, if not totally restricted, by the Israeli government. Now, in order to move forward in a discussion about ameliorating these conditions, it's worth entertaining the Israeli security apparatus's justification for this embargo. And that's that the dominant political faction in Gaza, Hamas, has consistently used the trafficking of goods, regardless of what it is, building materials, to in fact launch attacks on Israel. They've imported concrete, used them to make tunnels. They've actively tried to buy weapons from Iran. And there is evidence that they've used Iranian-made rockets, bought rockets, to attack and attempt attacks on Israeli civilians. So the question is, with these two disparate sides, Israel saying we need to maintain an embargo on Gaza because it keeps them from launching attacks on our civilians, and the obvious need on the other side to, to palliate a desperate humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip how do we move forward between reconciling those two views? Um, first, I think it's important to remember that two countries um, are directly involved in the embargo, as you say, of Gaza. One is Israel and one is Egypt. So um, Egypt is, you know, for whatever reasons, whether it's being forced by the U.S. or by its agreements with Israel or whether it's doing it because the current army doesn't, you know, is not in favor of the Muslim Brotherhood, whatever the reasons, it's not only Israel that's enforcing this embargo, and um, that's, it's important to know. I mean, it's true, 90% of the concrete that the world community gave last time to rebuild Gaza was used to build tunnels and bunkers. Um, you know, and the, all of the rockets that have been fired by Hamas in Gaza have been aimed at Israeli civilians, and many, many Palestinian civilians died in the Israelis' responses. Um, you know, it, the, when statisticians look at the numbers, they find it very strange that the bulk of the people that died are the age of the fighting people in Gaza, yet the bulk of the people are seen to be as civilians. In other words, they're males between the ages of 16 and 35 or 40, the vast, vast majority of people who die, um, not, you know, in many cases, and in some of the cases that have been described, the four children on the beach, the, there's currently an Israeli military investigation, and most likely people will be um, prosecuted over that. Um, and the, I want to know when any um, Arab or Palestinian organization is going to be investigating and prosecuting Hamas for the things it does to its own citizens by launching from the middle of schools, mosques, 
and um, endangering its own people, not allowing them to leave when Israel gives warning. We never gave warning once in Afghanistan and Iraq before we attacked places. Israel gave warnings over and over. And so um, the loss of life is tragic, but I do not believe the responsibility is all Israel's. Far from it. Um, I think Hamas is is responsible because it put its own citizens in danger by not using the concrete to build um, uh, protections for its own citizens. Notice that they were deep under, none of the leaders were, were up on top, but they left their citizens to be up on top. Gaza has been under blockade since 2007. Um, let me give you some figures about Gaza. Uh, the population of the Gaza Strip is over 1.8 million. Uh, its size is 139 square miles. Um, the size is about twice the size of the District of Columbia. I'm sure most of you are familiar with how large or how small the district is. Um, the district has a population of 646,000 646, times two, the population of double the district is still less than the population of the Gaza Strip. Um, under this siege, um, since 2007, Israel shoots across the border from Israeli territory into Gaza to enforce a self-proclaimed buffer zone. Uh, and since 2007, 214 Palestinians have been killed by Israeli snipers across the border. This is not during times of war. And 825 have been injured. During the same period, five Palestinian fishermen have been killed and 25 injured by Israeli naval forces. We need to keep in mind that this blockade, yes, Egypt is part of the blockade, but um, the vast, 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 I don't know what, 90%, 95% of the border of the Gaza Strip is blockaded by Israel. Now, you would dig tunnels too to get supplies, to get arms. Uh, and you would build bunkers um, to protect yourself. So I don't really find all of that so strange or so warlike. warlike. What needs to happen here, to my mind, is that the blockade has to stop. Food has to be allowed in, uh, materials for the reconstruction of Palestinian homes and industries has to be allowed in. Well, the, when, when we are trying to search for a solution, um, of course you have to, you know, it's easy to blame and um, like, you know, point the fingers and who began first and so on. So, um, this is, uh, we need to think about how to prevent war. Um, war is destructive. If you see the pictures of homes demolished, children in pieces, you know, I see that, you know, during the 30 days war last uh, uh, July, you cannot imagine the amount of pain that one felt from just seeing this. And that, you know, the, well, the persistent question that, that should come to our is how to stop this. Uh, uh, that the, um, you know, blaming one side or the other is, is, is an easy thing. So, um, in the 21st century, where we have uh, with all the technology that we have today, we are capable of manufacturing weapons that kill hundreds of people in just seconds, in a matter of seconds. And we fail as world superpowers in manufacturing means of safety and protection. So, Yes, there are definitely stupid behavior from uh, the Palestinian side or uh, 
radicalization and extremism and all sorts of things. But the main focus should be not to uh, make and use uh, these uh, 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 weapons of mass destruction that, that traumatize uh, an entire uh, region. So we need to figure out solutions to protect civilians uh, of any part and any place. That is that is the, the, the priority. And definitely, you know, as you know, just seeing the conditions that the uh, inhuman living conditions of the people in Gaza, it, it, it is just we need to remind ourselves of our responsibility that you know these are human beings who deserve to live, to have food, to have decent uh, 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 infrastructure that uh, that allows them to live freely. They, they are, in a, as everybody knows, in a large uh, jail that they have no that no access to the outside world. So we need to do that, and we need to figure out diplomatic ways to disarm the factions that practice these things, and figure out you know find a way to prevent that. Being the the, the more powerful side, I'm speaking about Israel. Is you know I I just had a verse in the Quran. Simply, I've been advising Muslim students, and you know I'm here to not address the political aspects. You know, I'm, I'm glad we have uh, all professors of political science here to address all of that. But you know, I'm here to represent the the, the, the point of view of uh, you know many Arabs. I'm not saying everybody, but many Arabs and Muslims in the region um, who would feel you know and how do you feel about this? So. A verse in the Quran, just like you know, I don't have to search for it, but it, it reminds the children of Israel of the uh, the, the punishment or the, the suffering that they have been through at the ruling during the Pharaoh time, and he used to kill their sons and, and keep their daughters alive, and that God protect you and saved you from the uh, humiliation under the rule of the Pharaoh. So this is a reminder that uh, you know. And of course, in recent history, what happened uh, in uh, Nazi Germany, the, the, the entire city, the Holocaust, and the, 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 the unbelievable torture and suffering and, and burning and humiliation and clean, cleansing of, of the Jews in, in, in that uh, time. So uh, the, the state of Israel should really be the, the, the most to understand the pain. And in... Uh, in, in, in in realizing that there needs to be an effort done to prevent any other human being from going through the same experience. And ironically, the opposite is what's happening, and the pictures of, of the story in Gaza is just visible, and we don't have to keep repeating the facts. The facts are out there for everybody to, to see. So let's be humans. Let us try to treat the Palestinians, even if we, you know, the, the verse of the Quran that I, I want to, you know, quote in that regard, chapter 41, uh, verse 34, the good deed and the evil deed cannot be equal, repel the evil with one which is better than verily he between whom you, uh, uh, between whom and you there was enmity will become as though he was a close friend. So the teaching of the Quran is that you need to resist evil with good. If there is any hope to change, you know, the reality there, the atmosphere has to change. This atmosphere of hatred, of complete lack of trust, trying to eliminate your enemy and, and just believes that its fundamental dignity has been respected, that its narrative has been respected, uh, that its security will be guaranteed, and for the last. Uh, years, 20 years, 22 years since the Oslo Agreement, we haven't been able to arrive at such a point. And tragically, we seem here in the fall of 19, uh, 2014 to be even farther uh, from such a point. My own sense is that de facto, what we increasingly have with Israel proper and West Bank is de facto one state. Uh, one state without equal rights. Uh, I think, I think at some point, 
the, especially the younger generation of Palestinians will begin to demand equal rights in one state. As the two-state solution recedes, as ever recedes as a possibility, I think the possibility of the one-state demand will increase. Ironically, there are elements on the Israeli right who already favor one state, confident that somehow the Israeli majority, the Jewish majority can be preserved even in one state. Uh, this, this is becoming, a, 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 ironically, a viewpoint on the uh, Israeli right. So I think in the years to come, the one state possibility, whatever form it will take, will become increasingly to the fore as the emergent generation begins to perceive the impossibility of two states. You know, Meron ben Benisti said this 30 years ago when he said that the Israeli settlement project had already obliterated the possibility of two states. Ben Benisti, I think, probably hoped that by saying it, he would, by making that prophecy, he would prove himself wrong. But unfortunately, he hasn't been proven wrong in the 30 years since he said it. So, uh, I'm, I guess, as you can see, I'm, I'm not at all optimistic about seeing a, a two-state solution in, uh, in the foreseeable future. Frank, I, I second your notion. I don't have much to uh, add to that, but I would like to go a little bit on the end from the now. Um, regarding what you said about the development of the settler movement in the Israeli right, because we talk so much about our liberal perspective uh, on, on those states uh, or on some, and, you know, uh, political activists who can identify more as PLO or uh, um, left of center uh, Israelis. But the truth is that really interesting thing to follow and try to understand are the developments. Um, in Hamas, but also, and I don't know a little about that, but in the settler movement, and so following things that are being said over there, and then the voices are quite interesting. So, first and foremost, there's more and more advocacy of the, um, of the one state solution among them. And we didn't talk about that when we presented the settlement uh, movement, I was part of it, I was, I guess, presenting it uh, to a stranger, rather trying to spell out. Uh, what, what um, they believe or what draws them there. And I think for them, the bond, the almost mystical bond to the land is more important than political sovereignty. Um, but another thing uh, that is somewhat related, but also touches on the point that Muhammad made regarding the other face of this last war. This last war was so much like the other ones and so different uh, at the same time. And a few ways that it was different is A, that the U.S. And, and Egypt could not leverage in the same way as they did before, beforehand. And, and then, you know, you have the parties going into war, but the exit strategy is so much more complicated. But that's what I want to say. What I want to say is that at the end of that war, one of the most vocal speakers of, um, of the Israeli right, a man by the name of Ali Adad, said um, the following. The, if you look at the Israeli uh, uh, society, essentially the paradigm of the Israeli left was it has to be solved through negotiations. That is the only thing to tell, whereas the right uh, said it had to be solved um, by military might, because that is the truly, truly the only uh, game. Time this goes back to Jabotinsky and, and his uh, generation. What he said now, and I think it's quite interesting, that actually they were wrong all along. I mean, in the age of an asymmetric warfare, there is no victory. All of the premises of the right wing are changing. This really doesn't answer Joshua's question, and I apologize. We can talk about it some other time, but I just wanted to end that into the discussion. It's a point that we're going to make. It's all right, we'll go to the next question, and if you have something to say about this one, you can throw that in there as well. Hi. Um, I'm a 
Um, my name is Carolyn I'm from Boston, New York. My family is still there. Everybody I know or grew up around still lives in Boston City. I have a father. Philosophy was very devastating. Very, very devastating. Thankfully, my family is still alive. Let's hope that stays that way. The Israeli story and how it has been told here, I appreciate the nuances, but I definitely see a lot of Hasbara in the story in general and how it's being given about Hasbara and propaganda. And the propaganda has actually fueled a lot of support without an actual understanding of the United States, and that has, of course, turned into political and policy changes. In the United States. Now, looking at the history of foreign policy, my question is going to be about politics. Looking at the history of it, the United States has not changed its policy with Israel since the Cold War. Their relationships have been very similar, it has been the same. And that has unfortunately afforded the Palestinian lives of many Palestinians. As Palestinian, we're taught resistance. Not once did I hear the word resistance in this panel. The word resistance to an occupation. The story was told very nuanced, and I liked how it was told from all the different points of view. However, right now, currently, I was born into an occupation. I lived through wars. My friends were killed in wars. So to me, as a person, and that goes to what Mr. Muhammad was saying, is that life is unbearable. Living in the Gaza City is unbearable. Living under blockade is unbearable. So when I hear that the state of Israel is saying that they fear for their security, I completely understand. However, militaristically speaking, and looking at the weaponry that is used by Hamas, the, the weapons that they use are a joke. The weapons that they use are a joke. And when the state of Israel is saying that we are afraid politically, that is a joke as well. Because Israel has a lot of power in the region. And the United States has afforded it a lot of power. I understand the fear of the, of the people because I lived in it. However, when the state of Israel does this mix between I'm a victim slash I'm the aggressor, there needs to be much clearer language on what is happening. With regards to the two-state solution, I agree with you, Professor Gordon Levin, is that it's impossible. I think it is. One way to do it would be the one state solution. We no solution. Well, we've seen uh, we've seen operations of how they let them mowing the lawn in Gaza. Every two years now, there's mowing of the lawn. And I'm afraid personally for my safety. Do I want to return? Do I want to stay? Of course I want to return. However, am I going to live? My family was expelled from Yaffa, from Jaffa. And with regards to the right of return, it's a symbolic ideology. It's not whether we are going to return or not. It's a symbolic idea that we are acknowledged, our, our suffering was acknowledged just as the Jewish suffering is acknowledged every day. With regards to foreign policy, we've noticed that the United States during the peace process, the peace process, the peace talks have been talking, however, several days, several weeks, I apologize, several weeks before the end, Israel immediately announced 700 more settlements. So it seems to me that Israel just does not care about American input, which, is, which can be really worrisome for the United States' influence in the world and how it can change the world order. What are, my question is, what are some tools that the United States could use in order to put pressure on Israel to figure this problem out? Because realistically speaking, Gaza and the Palestinian issue is a pretty bad thing to happen to foreign policy and it takes up a lot of time from things that could be looked at more, more precisely and more indiscriminately. What are some tools that the United States could use to put pressure on Israel and the Palestinian leaderships as well in order to get to a solution as quickly as possible? The main tool that the United States can and should use is to cut off all subsidies to Israel. The three billion dollars we know about, and there's much more in terms of weapons, uh, logistical support, intelligence sharing. The U.S. should simply stop that. The U.S. is officially 
in favor of a two-state solution, and yet it has never done anything to attempt to prevent Israel from establishing more settlements, from increasing the population in the occupied territories. In addition, um, Israel subsidizes housing for settlers in the occupied territories. Hello? I'm not sure anybody here would be in favor of Israel subsidizing the housing for the settlers, and it's many fewer uh, subsidies than existed, you know, long before where it was, you know, kind of a clear economic gain for most Israelis to go there. It's certainly not the case anymore. Um, most of the settlers there are not there for economic reasons anymore. Um, they're mostly there out of ideological concerns. Um, and that's a big change. That's a change post Oslo. You know, the, the people who were there were the people who were at least likely to want to move, to want to negotiate, to want anything to change. Um, I think many of them like it. Um, I'm not saying that that's right, I'm just saying that that's the way it is. But I may have been the one who said Israel felt threatened. I didn't say Israel felt threatened by Hamas's rockets, although no country should have thousands and thousands of rockets falling on it. Um, that's just, that's not what should happen. And, um, uh, you know, Israel then is allowed to defend itself. How it defends itself is another means, but, and the, you know, earlier Professor talked about the tunnels. You know, the tunnels that really concerned Israel were the tunnels that were made under, um, into Israeli territory to attack civilians, where they had stretchers down there with medicine to knock out civilians and kidnap them. And that's what the cement that the world gave to rebuild Gaza the last time was used for. The bulk of it was used for those military and those type of tunnels. And that's just totally inexcusable and can't be allowed to happen. And no country would allow that to happen or should allow that to happen. Would any of our other panelists like to specifically address the question of what the US can do to influence Israeli policy? Yes, I mean, th there's no doubt that it is within the power of the United States to affect Israeli policy uh, significantly. Uh, this could be done either through cutting back of economic assistance, but more significantly through ceasing to provide uh, unquestioning support in international institutions for Israeli action. I mean, the Obama administration, you recall, attempted to bring about a settlement freeze. It succeeded partially, but then when a resolution came, I forget whether it was before the General Assembly or the Security Council, uh, declaring Israeli settlement policy as illegal under international law, the United States voted against it. Uh, it would, the United States theoretically could bring significant pressure on Israel. But again, in my pessimistic mood, this is very unlikely uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, the political structure in the United States is such that the only thing that, that the two parties seem to agree on in the United States is that Israel Israeli policy must not be significantly questioned or challenged. And, and this is reinforced by the whole context in the last decade of the war on terror. So you have a situation in which there is a, a, a solidarity uh, with the notion of America opposing uh, Islamic terror, Israel opposing is Islamic terror, uh, and uh, this in addition to the fact that, that there are deep ties uh, emotionally, historically, between Israel and the United States, Christian fundamentalism, sharing a biblical sense of the Jewish people's position in the land of Israel, uh, Israel being a democratic uh, society within the 67 lines. Uh, 
all of these factors, uh, plus the enormous skill and force of APAC uh, and other institutions, means that to expect an American president to significantly confront an Israeli government over uh, the peace questions and the, uh, the settlement question is, I think, to expect uh, impossible. One more question. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, what's your name? Uh, my name is David. I'm a sophomore here. Um, the first thing I say is my conscience would not be at ease if I mentioned the fact that I've been extremely disturbed with how uh, some of the conversation about the Gaza, the most recent war in Gaza, has been left unchallenged. Uh, you know, the Rabbi Bruce mentioned uh, no country should be able to tolerate thousands of rockets falling fall into their borders, but neither should a land and a people in a future country tolerate tens of thousands of rockets falling onto their land and their people and cause them much more suffering and death. Um, I also don't appreciate the language that's used to demonize uh, Palestinians as an uh, overly militaristic people and continual reference to how much they spent on uh, building rockets and tunnels that used for attacks. Even though I disagree with them, uh, I don't need to mention just how elaborate this feels. Um, military has become over the years and how much money they spend there. My comment, uh, my question is uh, mostly related for uh, Rabbi Bruce and Muhammad for that, but if the other three have something to say, I'd like to hear from them. And it's about uh, AP's decision to include a specifically Jewish voice and a specifically Muslim voice in this panel. As both of you have um, purported to represent uh, Jews and Muslims, and I agree with some, and in other cases, much of what has been said. Uh, I'm disappointed on one level uh, as an Arab Christian to see that the voices of Palestinian Christians um, are ignored or almost written out of the history, and that we've ignored voices, uh, you know, not necessarily ignoring the voices, but we don't acknowledge the voices of Palestinian Christians and the role they played in the conflict. But more importantly, I feel like it, it's a problem for just Palestinians in general, Muslim and Christian, regardless of their religion, because it continues, in my mind, to perpetuate a myth that this thing is, this conflict is primarily driven by religion. And I know we talked about at the beginning when people spoke about it's primarily a national conflict, yet throughout the conversation you've seen references to Muslims feel this or Jews feel this. Whereas in my mind, I don't see the Israeli Palestinian conflict as being significantly changed, whether it was a different ethnicity or a different religion, let's say. Uh, another oppressed people uh, had gone to colonize a different place where they were not from. I don't see or do any of you think that the uh, fundamentals of the conflict, which is the conflict itself, would be significantly different. Uh, for me, I see this issue as primarily driven by the continual colonization of a place that didn't stop at 40 years, 67, but continues today. And that's how I see this conflict. And by making allusions to um, a Jewish versus Muslim debate, I don't see it as very accurate. Do you agree with that, or do you think, uh, in fact, that matters significantly? That was the first thing Professor Wilson said, right? <laughs> I agree. Sorry, I agree with you. It's not a religious struggle. It is a struggle over territory. Um, I don't. Uh, I realize that the. Palestinian Christian voice has been left out of the panel and much of the discussion. Um, I don't know enough about it to know why, um, you know, where the true responsibility of that is. Um, I know that across the Middle East, the Christian population has declined dramatically over the last 30 or 40 years for, you know, various reasons. And um, so I don't think it's just in Israel, or um, that, that some of these trends may be going on. And um, I, I think you can't ignore the religion as part of it. Um, and I just want to finish with saying that you left out the Jewish connection to the land in what you said. You said the people that wasn't from there. And that's just not the case. The Jews are from there um, historically, and that's a historical fact. And when that is said over and over, 
and it is said across the, the Arab world um, that feeds the Israeli kind of uh, defense mechanism and feeds the, not the defense, you know, the kind of feeling like that they're never going to be accepted. And so why should they be uh, offering more peace? Or why should they be negotiating? So, um, you know, and I, that was something I wanted to ask. Is there a Jewish connection to the land of Israel? And why isn't that acknowledged? And should that be acknowledged? Or shouldn't it be? So that's a question that, that I, I think is worth looking at, not just, not, you know, specifically as you, but for, for the Arab world in general, because I don't hear often enough that there is. So I just want to clarify, um, maybe I could choose my words better. I do recognize that there is an attachment that Jews have, um, both religiously and ethnically, to Israel, and I recognize much of what you've said. Uh, However, I think the problem came with them coming as a colonizing people and uh, as a whole, I should say, because again, uh, Zionists were a very dangerous group and still are and have different ideologies about what their relationship would be with the Arabs. But the way it worked out with the, you know, the Nakba and the ethnic cleansing and continued colonization of lands, with what Professor Gordon most recently mentioned about uh, you know, taking more land from the West Bank, that's how the relationship has been and that is why they perceived as for because they, they don't choose to integrate themselves with the community they came into. I would like to add to this um, some that the role of religion, that's a that's a uh, sensitive question and uh, that you gave up. In my opinion, some of the answer such as that God is not named or there is a name of God. It's not named a single person in the region they are looking at as Palestinian or uh, Israel, we think of it that way. Some people will it's like life in general, we have religious people, we have non religious people. Have observant people and people who are not afraid of religion, even who belong to a uh, culture of their religious belief. Um, from my point of view and from my personal experience uh, as a person who comes from a uh, Muslim country and, and who feels the Arab, you know, the Middle East, the Arab world, Muslim countries, um, unlike what many people may think, religion really is uh, for many Muslims. Uh, is a source of, uh, is a pacifying force. Uh, given that the core models, the, uh, the, all the troubles that, uh, that the region is going through, and all sorts of economic, political, social problems, uh, political unrest, violence, you know, all that's happening there, and definitely, absolutely in Palestine for, for Palestinians. Religion, in that case, for majority of people, and that's my judgment, is again is a is a refuge. When people are helpless, they pray. They go to the mosque, they pray, they raise their hands to ask God for help. And if you if you really see any footage of a Palestinian screaming at back and forth, you'll hear the word God a million times. So that just God, God, God was because they were. You know, forgotten and betrayed by, by all around them. So for them, religion is they need a salvation, they need a solution for their ongoing troubles and wars and killing and destruction and violence, losses and all of that. However, the continuation of these conditions, the continuation of uh, you know uh, this, uh, you know, what what these people are going through, what most of these are going through. Radicalizes a section of them. And we think that to look at it, misinterpret religion, see religion in a historical way, you know, look at, you know, treat, justify violence through religion, take verses from the Quran out of context that will justify for them to kill and those who cause violence and so on. So that's, a, that's the danger that something that I'm concerned about. So they would approach religion with, you know, with, without the proper knowledge. And without the balanced approach, you know, the Quran is full of guidance that encourages Muslims to respect the people of the world, the Jews and the Christians. That, you know, explicitly, and this is the difference very the point of my friend Bruce, is that um, God will, be, will not forbade, in the course of having Allah, God will not forbade the Muslims from being friends with those who do not 
put in one uh, and try to kill you or tell you how to land and so on. So the point I'm trying to make is religion plays a role. I think about the uh, we we have the luxury we live in the most progressive region of the world. We are it's the most educated. Yeah, but, but we are we have we are in a position to like look, read, analyze, make decisions, make the right conclusions. We, we are in a position to do that. But if we have somebody starving, we have somebody illiterate, we have somebody ignorant, we have somebody uh, going through a lot of hardship, we don't need to look. So we need to treat them and this is the world for the US. Just the difference between this point, you need to treat the Muslim and the Arab world, the Christians that live in the Arab world, with respect and try to. Yes, you are the most powerful. Yes, there is a connection between the US and Israel. That's that's fine. People have their own education, their own identity, their own interests. That's fine. But you need to address the issue with much more seriousness. Respect the religion of those people, see what causes agony to them. And I assure you, Muslims in I would you know the vast majority of Muslims are peaceful, they are very passive, they don't participate, they are not proactive, even in their own affairs. They are just you know, because they're exhausted. People there are yeah, people are so exhausted. So Muslim and Christians, and if we are interested in providing a solution to those people, respecting the Quran is explicitly stated, even if there's a conflict with the children of Israel, you know, God may show you mercy. This is what I've said the verses. God may show you mercy. God, this is a lot in Arabic. That there's a promise of mercy. The victorious doesn't have to massacre those who he defeats. And this is the takes us back to the war of Gaza. Can Israel protect the Israeli citizens without killing hundreds, half thousands of, of people in that country? Can just Israel protect itself without killing, you know, and attacking Palestinians? It shouldn't. So, you know, I mean, approaching that religion is a very sensitive issue, approaching it in the right way uh, can give us hope. Uh, Christians, you know, I, I'm sorry if I will be. Forget about the voice of Palestinian Christians, but thank you for bringing it up, and they are definitely a, 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 you know, a factor of this case. The point you made earlier about uh, settlement and colonialism, I agree with. I mean, yes, I mean, if the British, instead of enabling the Zionist movement to bring several hundred thousand Jews into Palestine in the 1920s and 30s had used the British mandate to attempt to bring 300,000 English uh, into Palestine, analogous to what they were doing in Rhodesia, there would have been equivalently uh, resistance. So it would have been an analogous conflict, although different actors in, in the conflict. So it isn't fundamentally that it's Jews and Arabs, it's fundamentally a contestation uh, uh, for the land uh, and the definition of the land. Um, and one other point I wanted to make, uh, I was struck uh, over the last week by the fact that some number of Israeli intelligence uh, officers had uh, refused on principle to continue to work in the secret intelligence operations in West Bank uh, because of the, the use to which their information was being put to uh, coerce uh, Arabs into becoming, uh, in effect, collaborators with Israeli intelligence in West Bank. Uh, so on one level, their protest reveals uh, an aspect of Israeli policy which is dark. But it's also true, and this is the tragic reality of Israel, it's also true that Israel is the only place in the Middle East where 43 intelligence officers would dare to do what they did. So 
this is the duality of Israel, uh, which goes back to that question about apartheid and the complexity of using uh, such a such a term in regard to Israel. I promised Tiffany before this event she could ask one question. So <laughs> Tiffany, go for it. Finish it off for us. Thank you so much for um, your time tonight. So I'm an international student, so throughout this entire time, it's almost been a bit of a culture shock to hear the Israeli, Israeli-Palestine conflict being presented in such balanced terms. So at the beginning of the conversation, we talked about, um, we described it as two competing nationalist movements. And it seems that this way of presenting the conflict, it seems to be, to me at least, it seems to be a very like, American phenomenon. Like, I hardly ever hear this referred to this way outside of America. There's a lot more to talk about, you know, like imperialism and apartheid. And, and um, I guess this is more directed towards the professors. So would you say that this kind of tendency to portray this conflict was having like two sides to the debate, um, both are equally valid. Is that very prevalent, do you think, in American higher education? And if so, do you think there are limitations to present the issue in such a format? And do you think there are limitations to the conversations in life? Um, great. I, I hope that it is a characteristic of American higher education that we can do this. Um, I think, I would say this also about America, and I'm thinking about times that I've walked through Queens and elsewhere. America has the capacity to temper and to dissolve in the United States conflicts and tensions which in their homelands are insoluble. Somehow, when transferred to the United States, the political culture of America is a, uh, a dissolvement of the worst passions. And so I think it's, it's in part a function of higher education, but it's also, in part, the best of the United States. I suppose at this moment I should stand up and share the United States, but frankly, I do think that um, the American notion of objectivity and the American notion of bias um, is based on presenting both sides and both sides equally and not making judgments. And I do think this is a limitation on discussions of world problems, not just Israel and Palestine, but within the United States and over the world. I'll follow up on that, you know, specifically regarding the, the conflict, you can see that it is, it is being taught in, in one way in courses in Middle Eastern studies. In another way, when it's taught at the debate studies of